whole life I've been running after one thing To find that part within that I'll measure up to something I've got a lot of dreams, but I was told I wasn't practical I couldn't measure up because of all my flaws But I know the wrong is the only stepping stones Life's the art of embracing these things, yeah Joshua Becker, Joe Darago, thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. And before we go into what people know you guys as for the minimalist approach, the mindset, the hope effect, so many great things that you are pouring into this world, I want to know something different about you. I want the audience to hear not just this, but like what? Give us, give us a little tidbit, something people might not know about you guys. Joe, you starting us off here? <laughs> Take it, Joe. Oh, I guess I can. <laughs> uh, my wife and I uh, just recently moved into a home that we self-built while we were living in a trailer in Colorado. Whoa. So uh, I grew up always renovating things, not because I'm, like, super talented, but because I'm super cheap. And I figured it's a lot easier to build from the ground up than to renovate something. And so my wife and I moved into a 26-foot trailer with our 18-year-old daughter and our dog, Henry. And we lived in there for 10 months and three days while we built the house from ground up. And the coolest grandpa, the youngest slash coolest grandpa. Don't forget to mention that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. well, you know, we had children when we were 13. And so <laughs> it was, uh, it's great to get grandkids started early. Yeah, our son and his wife, uh, Caleb and Taylor, they... Uh, gifted us with a grand a granddaughter, Brynn Leanne, in August Congrats. of this year. So Congrats. we're uh, we're thrilled. Congrats. I am a twin. Uh, I have a twin brother who's a couple minutes younger. Uh, I am a barely six foot, hundred and seventy five pounds, and he's what? six what? five, two forty, two fifty. So he, I always say, we spent our high school years with him uh, starting center and starting tight end on the football team, and I played on the tennis team. So that, that was my high school years growing up. And uh, anything else different about me, uh, contrary to Joe, who built his own house, I can barely swing a hammer, and I cannot fix anything. I tried to replace the bathroom fan in my bathroom and it was a two and a half week project and we finally had to call someone in to come and do it. So Josh, <laughs> we are one in the same brother. My wife will tell you if something has more than two instructions on it, I am not doing it. I, you know what? I, I give you a lot of props for actually going for it for two and a half weeks. I give up right away. Like anything handy or you put me out in the wilderness. I found this out going glamping not like this past weekend actually. I, I can't survive. Like, I need someone to come start the fires for me, roast my marshmallows for me. I'm hopeless, guys. I'm hopeless. So I'm glad you are too, Joshua. Thank you. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> All right. On the podcast, we talk about, like, when people have gone through these situations in life where they really came to the realization of the purpose that they are here for. Maybe it was a stuck situation. They made a pivot and found their breakthrough. And I really want to dive in on, Joshua, I know you've told this story many times that I think it is so powerful of figuring out why you wanted to go from being a pastor to becoming this minimalist lifestyle with your son in the garage. So can we touch on that, and which has sparked basically a, it's kind of like, almost like CrossFit. It's like minimalist is now like a, like a thing. And you guys were at the forefront of creating this mindset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was the uh, I was the first blog dedicated entirely to minimalism uh, 12, 13 years ago. Yeah, pivot. That is a uh, that is a, a brilliant way to describe it. Um, certainly, minimalism fit into my worldview, um, but I had never been introduced to the word. I'd never been introduced to the intentional pursuit of owning less. 12, 13 years ago, 12 and a half years ago to be exact, uh, I was living in Vermont. I had two kids. My son was five. My daughter was two. Uh, we woke up on a holiday weekend to do our typical spring cleaning. It was a Saturday, so we, I always say we woke up to do what most Americans do on Saturdays, clean the house and run some errands and uh, do their stuff. 
I went out to the garage. It had been this long winter in Vermont. Uh, I had my five-year-old son, and I had this vision that he would be helping me clean out the garage. Uh, it seemed like this incredible father-son moment that we were going to have. He lasted about 30 seconds and ran off in the backyard to play with his toys. And uh, I started working on the garage. One thing leads to another. Hours later, I'm still cleaning out the garage, pulling everything out to hose it all down and organize it. Uh, my neighbor, um, she's outside. She's doing all of her yard work. And at one point, I think we just struck up this conversation. My son had been running up every 20 minutes to see if I was done. Just kept pushing him off. Give me a few more minutes, a few more minutes. She, I think, was noticing this interaction. And so... Uh, she happened to walk past me, and she said sarcastically, oh, the, the joys of home ownership, huh, Joshua? Uh, and I responded by saying, well, you know what they say, the more stuff you have, the more stuff you own, the more your stuff owns you, which I had read on a cat poster somewhere or something. <laughs> and she responds, she says, you know, that's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And I, uh, I looked across the yard at my driveway, where there's this pile of dirty, dusty things I'd spent all morning cleaning and organizing and taking care of. And I would have said, just like everyone else, that I'm not looking for happiness in my possessions. My things aren't making me happy. I'm not trying to buy things to be happy, right? Like we all say that. But as I looked at the pile of things, um, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my five-year-old son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard, where he had been all morning long playing alone by himself. And suddenly I had this realization that all the things I owned weren't just not making me happy, but all the things that I had accumulated were actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness. And not just happiness, but meaning and joy and significance and fulfillment and purpose. And it's a, it's a very different realization. It's, it's one thing to say, like everybody does, that my possessions aren't making me happy. Uh, but it is another pivot. It is a, a different life bulb mo light bulb moment. Uh, when we begin to realize how much of our lives we actually waste chasing, accumulating, managing, cleaning, organizing, all the things that we've bought, uh, all the physical things that we have. And so that, uh, that started our journey to intentionally own less and start a blog that weekend. And um, yeah, it's quite a, um, quite a movement. I'm, I'm not the first, uh, obviously, to write about it. Um, but um, yeah, I like to think I had a... Played a, played a role in that. Take a quick break in the podcast because you know what I love almost more than anything is a great cup of coffee. Oh, I just wake up excited for my coffee. You know what I'm talking about. If you're a coffee person, if you're not a coffee person, you need to kind of just check. Uh, yeah, yeah. Check your priorities. But what else do I love? I love workouts. I love training. And what if you could put workouts and coffee together? You always thought about like, you know, coffee is just this natural pre-workout. And then you got pre-workouts. What if you had the best of both worlds? Well, now you do. Workout coffee is finally here. I wish I would have created this. Such a great concept and idea and where nature meets science. And all the workout coffee products are powered by Theofit, which is a high potency Theoflavin enriched black tea extract that is patented and clinically proven to improve exercise performance and reduce recovery time. So the question is, what are Theoflavins? Great question. Naturally formed from the oxidation of tea leaves, they've been shown to have strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, as well as supporting liver health, blood lipids, and the immune system. So think about that. You're getting all this and coffee, the taste of coffee, the energy of coffee, the cat, like, uh, my mind is blown. I am going to wake up in the middle of the night, have a cup, have a cup in the afternoon, in the evening, like, keep it coming, work out coffee, check it out, workout-coffee.com. Look at the, the, the links in the show notes below. We are going to have a discount code for you in there too. Check them out and get your coffee today and your workout on 
Now, back to the episode. It's a modest way to say it. Two million followers later of this <laughs> movement that you have created. Yes. Joe, where did you come in the mix of minimalism and how you approach it and how it came into your life? Well, Joshua and I, we've been friends since college. Actually, I was in college and he was in a different one, but we were in the same town. And we had a mutual friend that rented out rooms to uh, poor college students. And uh, I didn't like living in the dorm. And so uh, one opened up in the place where Joshua was living. And so we actually lived together for a short period of time before um, I got married. And we went to the same church and we started working together. Uh, I was a pastor. At, at that point, and uh, Joshua and I worked together for a period of time, and he left Omaha and went somewhere else to be uh, a pastor, a few different places, and then our paths came back together uh, after he was trying to transition um, out of the ministry, the pastoral ministry, and into the minimalist world. Uh, we came back together and, and started working, and so I've known him and his wife, Kim, shoot, since two, uh, 1994, I guess, uh, we've known each other, and um, so I interacted with the minimalist message um, as Joshua started to. Uh, my wife and I, you know, were, um, uh, were pragmatists. I mean, we, we just live our lives in, in very similar fashions where we try to keep our stuff to the, to the minimal side. I don't know if I'd classify myself as a minimalist, but I would definitely say that um, the idea of decluttering your life with yes. pursuits and things that don't bring you joy and that don't lead to anything profitable, man, we're all about that. Oof. And I, uh, I've heard that story that Joshua has told. I've probably heard that story 800 times. I, I bet, you um, have. Over yeah. the years. And I, and I love it every single time because it's a great reminder of, to pursue what's, what's really, what's really going to last, you know? Um, as, as we were just talking about, I became, you know, a grandparent here recently and, you know, nobody gets to being a grandparent at the early stages of life. Like if you're a grandparent, you're, you're towards the end, man. I mean, you might have a significant amount of years left, but you're in the second half of life for sure. And so, you know, it's just more and more clear that, uh, we need to slough off the things that don't matter and focus on the things that do. And uh, man, I hope, uh, I hope that my grandkids, and uh, if Lord willing, if I get to see my great grandkids, I hope they realize that they're important and that the, the stuff in life around me isn't. In a, in a, in a very significant way, uh, minimalism uh, brought me and Joe back together because um, yeah. we had uh, been together, we lived together, we worked together at a church in Omaha and then uh, I moved to Vermont, and he moved to Arizona to to plant a church. And I had my experience up in Vermont and began uh, began writing. But we weren't we weren't talking very often, um, hardly at all, actually. Um, and um, at one point, uh, he just called me up out of the blue, and he'd like I'd I'd like you to come down here and and speak at my church and and talk about minimalism and and introduce the people here to to what you're doing. Uh, and that brought us back into uh, into, uh, in a relationship that was 12 years ago, um, which then led to, to us working together again in Arizona, which led to us founding this nonprofit together. And so, uh, pretty, pretty significant way that, uh, your, your passion for this message, um, brought us, brought us back together. It's, it's amazing how God works in that way of how he puts people together <clears throat> when people are passionate with purpose. And you guys have been saying the word on mission. Passion plus purpose equals mission. And I love how you talk about the, not just the physical, because everybody sees the physical minimalism and they think, oh, I got to get rid of stuff. I got to get rid of stuff. But the clarity that it brings you in your mental capacity, in your joys, in your actual purpose. I mean, Jesus, greatest leader of all time, he's coming down and telling us, forget your things. Come follow me. Forget your things. So how do you help people and, and I want this to lead into the, the quote that I think is very powerful, that we will be known by the problems we solve. Because you guys had a good thing going, but you found something that, man, this has real purpose. So how do you teach people to implement this type of mindset as opposed to just thinking it's a physical, tangible type of thing? 
Okay, so uh, let me offer a, a number of different thoughts that, that come to my mind when you, uh, when you say that. So uh, my definition of minimalism is, minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value in life by removing anything that distracts us from it. Um, that became minimalism to me, to most people, isn't about I just want to own the least amount of things. Minimalism is about what do I need to own in order to be the best version of myself to accomplish those things in life that are most important to me? And then what is just all the stuff that has accumulated in my life that's actually keeping me from it. That was the pile of things in my driveway was keeping me from actually the thing that was most important to me. For me, uh, and for a lot of people, um, it started with the realization that I owned too many things. I owned too many possessions. And if you sit across the table from somebody and ask them, what do you most want to accomplish with your life? Nobody says, I just want to own a house full of junk. Like no one just says, I want to own as many physical things as I possibly can. Like deep down, we, we typically tend to speak about the same things. We speak about relationships. Uh, we talk about making a difference in the world, love, uh, faith comes up for, you know, a good number of people. And so those are the things that we, that we most want. What happens is, I'm pretty convinced, is that the world comes along, society comes along, culture comes along, advertisements, marketing comes along and convinces us that we actually want to be buying all these things. And so we start buying things we don't need, uh, chasing after things we don't need, accumulating stuff that we don't have to have until... There comes a moment, perhaps, where we're like, man, what am I doing with my life buying all this stuff? There are better things that I can be doing with my money and time and energy and focus. And so minimalism um, sparks that. And as we begin, I think, embracing intentionality in our possessions we can't help but wrestle with intentionality in other areas of life. I find that intentionality in one area really sparks intentionality in others. And so for me, it started with minimizing possessions. Um, and then I started getting a little more serious about my health and my habits, uh, my schedule, my commitments, the work that I was doing. What are all these other things that I've just kind of bought into this worldly, uh, worldly isn't the right word, this, the, the cultural notions of what my life is supposed to be like, rather than like, what am I actually designed to do? And uh, what are the things that I need to stay focused on in order to accomplish those things? So that was... There's a lot of thoughts there, and, and uh, people embrace intentionality in different areas. I've known some people who have taken care of their, um, of their diet, intentional in that area, which then sparks intentionality in their possessions. And so there's other ways to go about it, but, uh, man, I, I usually tell people, if you, if you want to change the trajectory of your life, like just change one habit, uh, get intentional about one thing in one area, uh, and the more you grow in that, the more you begin to see other spaces where you've just unintentionally given up control of, of your life. Mm. Isn't it interesting to think, like, you hear this, and I hear this, and every time I listen to you guys, it's just such a freeing feeling. I'm like, man, it can give up this stuff. Like, I'm just, I can clear my mind. And it's just, it's, it's a great life rhythm to have. And to listen to... People that I love that I heard you guys on, John Mark Comer, he's talking about the ruthless elimination of hurry and how important Sabbath is, and it, and it feels so good, but yet we are so ingrained as a society, as people, to want more, want more, want more, want more, do more, do more, do more, do more, and just be on this never-ending hamster wheel. Like, is it like, uh, I don't know where I'm going with the question, really, other than it's just, how do you help people, and Joe, maybe you touch on this as being 
a pastor and you both have been pastors. How do you help people just step away from society and realize, man, there's a better life I can live with more purpose and actual what I call Jesus pace, where the dude is getting so much done, but yet he's never in a hurry. You know, one of the passages that Joshua really helped me see a little bit differently or maybe a, maybe deeper would probably be a better way to say it, was Jesus tells this story um, about this farmer that plants different kinds of seed, and some seed falls among a path that's, like, super hard. Some seed falls, falls on rocky soil, and, you know, so it is this different types of soil that this good seed falls upon. And, and one of the seeds grows up quickly, but... Um, life's worries and um, uh, desires choke it out, like it chokes out the plant. And I really think that uh, for, for most of us, um, we have to understand that our lives are going to be led by somebody. They're either going to be led by the commercialism, they're going to be led by the politicians, they're going to be led by people who have great ideas for your lives, or they can be led by you. You can decide how to lead your life and really focusing on what's truly important in your life is what's going to get you the most traction so that you end up at the end of your life not regretting the life that you've lived. Like Joshua says, nobody ever gets to the end of their life and goes, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. I wish I would have bought more junk. I wish I would have had bigger storehouses. Like nobody gets there. They all have the, we all have the same thing. I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have been more generous to people. Like, so um, another, man, Joshua, I'm quoting you here, but another <laughs> thing that Joshua has helped me out with uh, in life is that, uh, you know, we can really race up the ladder, but and sometimes we get to the top of it and realize we ha had it leaning up against the wrong wall all along, you know, and so get... I think what minimalism and Joshua's message really has helped me with is make sure the ladder's on the right wall and then focus your life on, on that stuff and get rid of the other things that are distracting you um, from accomplishing that. So practically for me, how that's really fleshed out is I, I just have a morning routine that's been developed where I sit down, uh, you know, I, I, read, I read something, um, I read a passage of scripture, I reflect on that, I'm a person of faith, obviously, I read that, I reflect on that, what is that saying to me, and then I have a little gratitude list, what am I really grateful for, which keeps me centered on what's really important in life, and then uh, I make sure that my day um, is going to go down the road with the values that I've already established, and so really helping me just keep the ladder on the right wall and then I can climb with great confidence. So I love that the ladder on the right wall and the, the purpose that you guys have. And you know what I love people that have a platform that have created something which you guys did. I mean, you could have just sat back and been like, oh, I'm just going to blow this up and be the biggest name in this and this and everybody get all this, this accolades and everything, but you used it for a bigger purpose. And that's where the hope effect comes into play. So can you guys talk on the hope effect and how powerful it has been in getting kids out of orphanages into loving, but just like awesome families and how we all can support it and just give us the rundown on it. I want the audience to know. Oh, oh, you know that feeling you get when you just wake up and you are not rested or recharged? Yeah, we all have it. We all go through it. How do I wake up with full energy every single day? It is literally the game changer itself, chilly sleep. I have an Uller that goes underneath my mattress and cools my body temperature to the ideal temperature to get deep sleep, REM, high HRV scores. Now I have mine pretty cold at about 57 degrees. The optimal level is between 57 and 65 degrees. I have a weighted blanket, which just cools my body. and I'm just sleeping in restorative sleep. So when I wake up in the morning, no matter how many hours I get, I am juiced up and ready to go. And lucky for you, you can wake up the same way. The people at Chili Sleep are giving you a discount, giving you a code. So go to chilitechnology.com forward slash pages forward slash David Nurse to get your special discount pricing there. Remember, that is chilitechnology.com forward slash pages forward slash David Nurse. Or just click the link below and it'll take you right there. It's sleep like a polar bear.
tonight. Get the best night's sleep of your life. Chilly sleep. Uh, let me uh, let me give the quick backstory to um, to how we started it, uh, and then I'll let uh, totally. Joe jump in uh, with some of the some of the specifics. Uh, you mentioned a quote, and I, I I guess I didn't lead my answer into any of it. Um, will be known by the problems that we solve, <clears throat> which, uh, which I first heard from a, a gentleman named Jeff Schinnebarger uh, down in uh, Georgia, uh, will be known by the problems that we solve. And it is, um, <clears throat> it is true. I, you know, the, the people that we look up to and, and champion in society are, are typically people who, who overcame problems. They solved problems, sometimes problems they made by themselves, uh, sometimes problems that were given to them by, by nature, uh, some just problems that they saw in the world uh, and they, they worked to overcome them. And uh, little, I really strongly believe that to be um, a, a motivating factor in, in my life. I had, I had started the blog. Uh, the blog grew. Um, <clears throat> Uh, reached the point where uh, different publishers were asking me to to write a book, and became pretty clear that that they were going to pay me a handsome royalty to to write a book about not buying stuff. And I remember just <laughs> sitting problem. down with my wife on the on the couch in the living room and being like, "I think we're going to be tested whether we actually believe everything we're writing." I mean, it's one thing to not buy a lot of stuff when you're you know, getting by paycheck to paycheck, it's it's another thing to to not go buy a bunch of stuff when uh, when they're a, a, a big payday uh, shortly down the shortly down the road. And um, I, I think we both knew that we weren't going to go buy big screen televisions and nice furniture and bigger house uh, with the money, but we wanted to uh, solve a problem in the world. Uh, my wife um, was adopted, and so adoption was always pretty. Uh, significant uh, orphan care was always pretty important to us. So we uh, we took the book advance money from uh, both books, actually, the, the More of Less and The Minimalist Home, uh, and we used that to, um, we knew we were going to use it to, to start a nonprofit organization, which then is where uh, Joe got involved and uh, really his his brains and, and his experience that, that he was seeing, uh, things that he was learning uh, about institutional orphan care around the world. Uh, and so that's how we that's how we started the Hope Effect, and I mean, obviously, lots of background to that story. But I'll just let Joe hop in and um, share what it is that we're doing specifically, because it's a it's a problem in the world that most people don't know about. But I, I always say, once once you hear it, um, people are like, "Oh, I never even I never thought of that." But you're totally right. Go ahead, Joe. Well, thank you. Uh, one thing I appreciate, um, one of the many things I appreciate about Joshua is he does um, live out what he talk, What He lives out his talk, you know? Like, he's not just somebody that says one thing in front of people and then lives a different way. I mean, he's a man of integrity, and, and uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I seriously value his input and, uh, and his leadership in my own life. Um, so kudos to him for that. Uh, Joshua came to me in a interesting time in my wife and I's life, we, um, lives, we had adopted a child, oh shoot, it's been 22 years now, um, Sydney, uh, she was, uh, her parents realized they couldn't take care of her, uh, so they signed her rights away when she was uh, born in, in the hospital. Uh, she went from the hospital into a, a, a foster family for a few months, and then uh, she came into our arms, our loving arms, when she was just about five months old, just under. And um, we had two bio we have two other children that are biological, uh, one that was born before her and one that was born shortly after her. So our family of three, you know, continued um, for, oh, many years where, uh, 16 years actually, where we were just our family of three. And then my wife and I, because of Sydney, continued to learn more and more and more about orphans around the world. And we learned that 95% of the world's orphans are over the age of five, and that their chances of being adopted are super slim. Less than 1% of the world's orphans will be adopted this year. Less than 1%. Wow. And wow. so we said, you know what, we're not, we're not like the best parents in the world, but we do have an extra room in our house. Like we could do something cool. for another child. And so we opened up our hearts and our home to this time an older child. And we adopted Mia. Uh, I met her just a few days after she turned 12. Her story is very different than our daughter Sydney's. 
Um, she was abandoned, went into a government orphanage in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, and she spent those early developmental years in that orphanage. In those early developmental years, uh, nobody really gave her the one-on-one -on -one attention that a child deserves. You know, I'm a, a parent of four kids and a grandparent now, and watching my son interact with his child is like such a, a blessing. But, you know, he stares at her in the eyes. They interact. She coos. He makes noises back. And what I've come to learn in research is that the brain is actually developing through that mirroring that is happening, through that interaction that is happening with a parent. And when a child grows up in an institution, they're one of many children in a sterile room with a rotating staff every eight hours, if they're lucky, and they're barely getting their needs met. Is it better than the street? Absolutely. Is it as good as a family? Not even close. And so uh, Mia spent those early years in an in institution, and it has uh, permanently set the course of her life in a direction that um, even with all the love and grace and help that we can give her, um, her life will forever be different than the life of our daughter, uh, Sydney, who came into a family very early. Every child deserves to be in a family, yet millions of children yeah are being abandoned to sterile institutions called orphanages around the world. Currently, there are estimates there are about 15 million uh, orphans in the world. As I said, less than 1% of them uh, will be adopted. Traditionally, they will go into orphanages. Uh, and while better than the streets, um, uh, children come out of orphanages as young adults in far worse condition than, when, than a child that comes out of a family uh, as a young adult. Uh, a child raised in an institution compared to a child raised in a family is 10 times more likely to fall into sex trafficking work. They're 40 times more likely to, be in, to have a criminal record. And uh, sadly, they are 500 times more likely to commit suicide. A child is without hope often if they are raised in an institution and then um, age out of it without um, the love and support a family can provide. And so what we are doing is because we're passionate that every child deserves to be in a family, we are working with governments um, wherever we can to help them to develop um, the understanding that institutionalization of children is not the best thing and it damages them. And we help them come up with family-like solutions. It's often it looks like a private public uh, uh, foster care type of venture that we uh, come alongside the government and help them implement. And, uh, you know, our hope is that we can see in our lifetime the end of institutionalization of children uh, around the world. Um, you know, wow. I just think about, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going back to my no. grandkid here, but, uh, you know, if God forbid if something were to happen to my son and his wife in a car accident or something, and they were, all of a sudden, we find in a situation where our granddaughter had to be cared for, would any of us want them to go to an orphanage? Absolutely not. We would want them to go into a loving family. I mean, that is the, we would want them to go, we would want her to go into a family that would love and care for her the same way that her parents would. And, and so that right there on the very practical level is what gets me up in the morning. I want to help, um, I want to help children find that love and support that a family can provide. And I not only think this is the best thing for them, but I also think it's the best thing for our society. Um, I think that uh, in the long run, children that are raised in families are uh, far better for society um, than children that are raised in orphanages. And so um, we're in this for the long haul. We're in this to see change happen uh, for these kids specifically, but also change happen for the communities and where we work. Oh, man, I love that on so many levels and just what you guys are doing like this is the root cause of it like you see all these issues when people are older and you touched on the issues but it all starts from the family it all starts from how they are raised but yet it's 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 almost it's almost too late not too late but it's almost you, you said a number when we were talking offline like before the age of four like after four if they are not loved coddled like they they lose a lot of what would be said in their brain. Am I, am I saying that right? Yeah, so what happens when a child is uh, born, you know, and they have this parental interaction with, um, uh, with the child, 
you know, the mirroring that we often see, the, the, um, uh, the holding, the expressions of love, the holding tight, even the familiar sounds and smells of a caregiver, you know, all of these things that, that we just think are cute and lovely and, you know, go on Hallmark cards and, and you know, sure. pictures uh, that we, um, we, we like, to, like to see that make us feel warm and fuzzy. Well, what's really going on, science tells us, is that brain, the brain is being developed. Neural pathways are being formed because of these interactions that uh, the parents are having with children's with their children and so what we see is that these neural pathways that are developing pretty much get cemented in uh, before the age of four so a child that's raised in an institution where they stare at a ceiling most of the time as opposed to uh, staring into the eyes of a loving parent uh, their brain physically forms different you can actually scan the brain of a child raised in an institution and scan the brain of a child raised in a family and they look completely different uh, brains um, develop Man. differently which then leads to not only a lack of developmental um, um, not only the developmental of the, of, of the children in the long run um, that they have a hard time overcoming, but it makes them into survivors instead of thrivers is yeah. kind of how I like to, yeah. to phrase it. Phrase they it. see their world as something to navigate so that they can just survive because they don't have that attachment and acceptance and love and support of a family behind them. Uh, they feel like they're on, on their own. And so they manipulate their world wow. to their advantage. It's an amazing survival skill for sure, uh, but it's not for their best. And it's not for society's best either. Man, man. God did not put us here just to survive, definitely to thrive. And even if you're listening out there and you can't, I mean, go out and adopt. I know it's certain situations. But you can give. Everybody can give. I'm a firm believer. Everybody can tithe. It doesn't matter how much money you have, 10%. It's not our money anyway. So me and my wife will definitely be tithing to you guys. But how can we all follow you, support you, give to the Hope Effect? Well, you can find us online. Uh, HopeEffect.com is where you can find our website. You can learn a lot about us there. Uh, we have a blog that you can follow. We send out one monthly email. We're very minimalist uh, in our approach, <laughs> and so we keep our Funny. we keep our emails to a minimum um, as well. Uh, but we'd love to have people just learn. I mean, part of my deal is I I just want as many people to understand the plight of the orphan around the world as possible. Because while orphanages are better than the street, we as a people can do better. Mm. Kids deserve to be in families. We can make that happen. This isn't something that's out of our control. We can do better. And so whether you end up supporting the Hope Effect or not, I just really want people to understand what orphans are going through and that they can get behind organizations and they can be a part of the solution uh, not be a part of the problem. So you can find us on Instagram and so uh, and uh, Facebook as well. Uh, just search the Hope Effect. Uh, we have a white logo with a yellow um, looking home on it, and you can uh, you can find us there, and, and we can kind of keep you up to date. You can kind of follow along in our journey to change the way the world is caring for orphans. Awesome, awesome. I love it, guys. This time has flown by. I would love to keep talking to you guys for days on end maybe we get you out to here to california and come hang and we'll we'll take this even further but uh before we yeah. go off we're going to drop the mic here so i'm going to give you both the opportunity to just leave a one piece of advice it can be a one word it can be a one line it's just a drop the mic and before we get there though i want to one thank you guys for coming on the podcast giving your time and just being the people that you are and taking taking a platform for such a bigger purpose like we need more people mm -hmm. like you guys so no i'm always in your corner our listeners always in your corner to support two can you guys talk to my puppy who has about 59 toys and help him live a minimalist <laughs> lifestyle he thinks he needs a new one all the time yes i'm from iowa i've totally given into the bougie la dog scene i apologize Midwest, Josh. All right. I, uh, I do not. I do not imagine your dog went and bought the uh, fifty-nine toys himself. <laughs> That's right. There's, my wife there's, did. There's someone, there's someone else to blame there. <laughs> I'm blaming my wife, but I can't blame my wife. I blame myself. Okay. My wife's way cooler than I am. Everybody knows that. So <laughs> oh, it's on me. That's it's great. on me. All right, guys. <laughs> if 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 somebody is going through a stuck situation in their life, a difficult situation in their life, they cannot get out of it. They can't even see out of it. What drop the mic advice would you give them to make their pivot and go to achieve their breakthrough? 
I would tell them that the first step in crafting the life you want is to get rid of everything you don't. Uh, so I would uh, begin by removing uh, things that you don't want from your life, uh, and that will free up your finite resources uh, to begin pursuing things that do bring you life. Beautiful, beautiful. Joe, drop the mic for us. What you, that's Josh is Josh is well, out with his mic drop. What yeah, do you that, got? That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> everything good one. in life has been leading you to an opportunity to make an impact in the world. Your best days are ahead of you. Don't waste them. Mm. Both beautiful. Drop the mic, and we are out. Thank you so much, guys.